he was one of the co-inventors, two co-inventors of something called field theory, which is the way we describe the kind of physics we do at the Large Hadron Collider, which is going to open up for sure uh, this year, 2009. Dirac's work is all over what we call the standard model of the fundamental constituents of the universe, particularly through his work on field theory, but in most certainly his, his main contribution, if you like, most famous contribution, was through what's called the Dirac equation. What he did there uh, in late 1927 was to marry quantum theory and relativity and to produce a single description of the only known fundamental particle then, the electron, a, a, an irreducible speck of matter, so to speak. So Dirac married those two things together, produced that equation that was seen as a complete miracle by other people. There were something like 15, 20 people, Nobel quality, trying to do that. When Dirac sent his summary of what he'd done to Germany, he, he expressed it in four lines at the, as a postscript to a, to a letter he wrote. And they were, frankly, devastated. Nobody could believe, where, did, where on earth did he get this from? And it stands now as one of the great miracles of the 20th century. In the theories that describe your electrons, your quarks, your strangeness, your charm, and all the rest of it, the Dirac equation is absolutely smack bang in the centre of that. It is one of the miracles of, of modern physics. Some people, lay people, may be surprised by the emphasis that he put on beauty, that an equation should be beautiful, that a mathematical expression should have beauty. Can you say why, why that mattered to him and, and whether you think it, it, it ultimately does matter? You're absolutely right to say that Dirac was, in the end, obsessed with mathematical beauty. He was absolutely, it was almost a religion, he said to him, and indeed uh, to his colleague Erwin Schrödinger. What happened was that uh, having invented or discovered the Dirac equation, very, very beautiful thing. Why do, what do I mean by beautiful? Well, univer something universal describes every electron that's ever existed for all time. It's not, it's not just something that just works locally. Beautiful simplicity, a grandeur of sorts, and can't be changed at all in any way. When you write that Dirac equation down, you can't change anything. So just as you say that a great Milton sonnet is perfect, so to speak, you can say the same thing about the uh, Dirac equation. So they have a certain kinship, the beauty of a poem, the beauty of, uh, of, uh, of, 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 a, of an equation like the Dirac equation. Dirac came to believe very, very strongly that the way to set out really fundamental theories was to be guided by mathematical beauty. He said he, what, his, what he wanted to do was to let mathematical beauty lead him by the hand. And I suppose um, this is a bit of amateur psychology, so to speak. When you've discovered the Dirac equation and you've seen its gorgeousness, so to speak, which every theoretical physicist at an advanced level now knows about, right, it will make a huge impression on you. But it has to be said, perhaps this is a little bit harsh, but it has to be said that Dirac, I don't think, was ever able, after his great years, to turn that mathematical beauty into something productive, so to speak. That's not to uh, deny great his achievement in doing what what he did when he was a, a young man. But when, when he was an old man, he was preaching this thing, but never able to make it work for, for him. That said, if you look at modern theories of the fundamental nature of the universe, string theories, for example, what impresses the great leaders of that theory is the mathematical beauty of what, what they are dealing with. They have faith that the beauty of it can't be an accident, so to speak, even though there are great problems with it. There's no exper experimental evidence directly to support it at the moment, but they are being led by that mathematical beauty. And in a sense, they are following the spirit of Dirac in, uh, in, in taking that view. I wanted to ask you about an idea which comes up m more than once in the book, which is that great theoretical physicists do their best work by about the time they're 30. And if they've not done it by then, then, you know, the, mm -hmm. and it's probably all downhill after that. And I wanted to tie that to a comment Dirac made late in life about seeing his life as a failure. Mm -hmm. Do you think that was a serious evaluation on his part? I mean, he didn't, he didn't give flippant evaluations. So do you think he really felt he hadn't fulfilled 
what he he hoped he would when he set out as a young scientist. Well, it's true that when Dirac was young, he he was joking with Heisenberg about you know when you're thirty, you're more or less finished. It's it is a bit flippant. The cruelest and least charitable evaluation of Dirac's work would be to say that he'd done his best work by the top by the end of 1933, uh, and by uh, then he was 31. Actually. And he got his Nobel Prize in the same year. He got it in that year. You could also say it was the Nobel curse. The once you've got the Nobel Prize, you don't do anything else. Very unfair, I'm sure. But uh, you know, as I said, in the spirit of big generalizations, mm. one, one could nod to, to that without taking it wholly seriously. But I ought to say that Dirac did do some very fine work after that. He was doing good work. They still used today, right up until his early sixties, and I mean work that people like myself and people far better than I am at theory would kill to be able to make contributions like that. He did great work in in advanced quantum theory, in relativity when he was you know well on in years. But the most revolutionary work is is tends to be done by uh, by by younger uh, theoretical physicists. That that much that much is true. You ask about. Uh, the evaluation he made when he basically told Pierre Ramon at, at Florida State University after a talk that his life had been a failure. Well, yes, I mean, uh, I, I'm, I'm absolutely certain that uh, Pierre reported that accurately. And yes, Dirac was disillusioned, it has to be said. Why was he disillusioned? Well, he really did believe that the laws of physics have to account for the simplest things. Now, by his standards of rigor, the Quantum field theory, the thing that he co-invented, did more than almost anyone to, to establish. In his way of looking at things, if you look at the interaction between the electron and a photon, that's a particle of light, then the, the calculations gave these things infinities. They didn't give real numbers. They gave these huge, huge things, infinities that plague the theory. Other physicists believed very strongly that there were ways of handling that. Dirac simply could not live with them. And he simply disbelieved the uh, progress that was being made. Virtually everyone disagreed with Dirac about that. But Dirac's purity, remember uh, Niels Bohr called him the purest soul. Uh, Dirac's purity would not allow him to accept that. And that's why he uh, told Pierre Amor that he, 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 he genuinely believed his life had been a failure. You say in the book that one way of evaluating a scientist's career is to look at its posthumous productivity. And I wondered how you felt Dirac fared on that measure? I think Dirac is definitely uh, posthumously productive. I mean, people are still using uh, Dirac's papers. Uh, I learned, uh, I was fortunate enough to be uh, a visitor to the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, where they have a peerless uh, faculty of uh, theoretical physicists, and they still look at Dirac's work. I, I had several conversations with uh, with some of the great physicists there who were talking about reading his papers for profit. Now, that's extremely unusual, it has to be said. Science is ruthlessly opportunistic in the sense that once a paper is done and digested by the community, people put it into textbooks and don't look at the papers. But with Dirac, they are special. They really are special. And it is still something that leading physicists do with profit. Go back and read his work. And as I say, uh, his work on relativity, on quantum mechanics, still is yielding fruit now. Is around a quarter of a century since his death. This is a first mm -hmm. biography. Presumably you hope this will begin to establish his place in the pantheon of, of great 20th century scientists that so far has eluded him, at least in the in the popular imagination. Yes, well, Dirac, among physicists, there's no question about Dirac's uh, status. He would be, I mean, Einstein, I think, pretty well arguably at the top, but below Einstein are just a handful of people who could be fit to stand on that podium with him, and Dirac unquestionably is one of them. But he is uh, he's virtually unknown outside uh, the, the community of uh, theoretical physicists or at least scientists. I really hope that this book will make Dirac's achievement uh, widely accessible to many people. And it, it, I also say that I hope it's not the last biography of him uh, because there's a, you know, it, it's, it's a remarkable life and I hope other people have a shot at it too.